Hello and welcome to the Leading Edge webinar series brought to you by the Master of Science and Organizational Leadership Program and the Johns Hopkins University Office of Advanced Academic Programs. Today's event features a discussion with Kevin Robinson, the Director of Athletics for Catholic University on Leadership in Athletics. My name is Peter Huggins and I'm the event producer. Please note today's event will be recorded and uploaded to the AAP YouTube channel under the Leading Edge playlist. During the program, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A function and we'll answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A portion of the event. With that, I will turn the event over to our moderator, Krista Dreisbach, Associate Program Director and Senior Lecturer for the Master of Science in Organizational Leadership Program. Hi, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm really excited uh, to, to be hosting this tonight. Um, I'm having weird internet issues, and so now I'm on my cell phone hotspot and hoping that that's going to work. But in the meantime, I'm going to turn you over to Kevin, which is more important anyway. So Kevin Robinson uh, was introduced as the Director of Athletics Associate Vice President at Catholic University on June 2nd, 2023. He came to the university with 24 years of experience in collegiate athletics under his belt, having most recently served as the Associate Director of Athletics for Advancement at Mount St. Mary's University. Kevin took over that role in September 2021 after spending six years as the, as the Director of Athletic Development at Mount St. Mary's. He served the university in multiple capacities, including in university leadership initiatives, athletic development, athletic administration, and external relations and public relations. There's much more I could say, but I really want to turn it over to Kevin, but saying only that um, we first had this conversation last summer, and I was so excited about his thoughts on leadership, leading with love. He's going to talk about that. And so I'm so grateful that he's taken the time uh, out of this incredibly busy schedule to spend an hour with us. We will have a hard stop at seven. Um, Kevin has invited questions along the way. So if you want to put questions into the Q&A, uh, I'll, I'll try to monitor those. And between Kevin and me, we can field them. And then there, there will come a point at which Kevin may uh, stop and uh, allow 10 or 15 minutes for more Q&A. So Kevin, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Chris, appreciate it. And thanks for having me on here. I'm very, very excited to be joining uh, joining this group and uh, talking a little bit about my journey through athletics, uh, athletics leadership, uh, kind of my influences uh, that have uh, kind of guided me on, on, on this uh, on this path and this journey, and then dive into some more, uh, you know, technical aspects of, of leadership and athletics and how it's kind of evolved uh, over time, even from when I was, uh, you know, a student athlete, you know, 20, 25, 26 years ago until now, um, what that evolution in leadership and athletics looks like. Um, I, and I also appreciate everybody's time today uh, and, and joining us. And like like Chris said, uh, if you guys have questions, feel free to fire away. I'm pretty informal in how I in how I operate. So, you know, I always look forward to uh, kind of interruptions and, you know, just making sure that we are having a having a very healthy dialogue around uh, around the topic, in this case, uh, leadership in athletics. Um, so with that being said, uh, Chris Tut touched on some of my you know, background, but I want to kind of dive into that a little bit more. Uh, grew up, uh, I grew up in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, uh, pretty much on the campus of Mount St. Mary's University. Very fortunate that both my parents um, were in education. And, you know, my mom was a high school teacher who evolved into um, uh, athletic, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, administration, administrative roles uh, in, in education, uh, most notably as the director of math in Baltimore County. Uh, and then my dad has been a longtime professor at Mount St. Mary's University. He's just starting his 38th year there as a professor. So it's kind of my background and kind of how I got involved in uh in the world of college, I, I sit. I tell everyone, um, you know, I, I stepped on a college campus when I was six months old, and I've never left. <laughs> and I, I really enjoy the the atmosphere that goes on, the learning that goes on on a college campus, the sharing of information, just the the growth and uh, maturity that occurs um, on college campuses, and, and it, it really gives me a lot of joy to watch that. Uh, and then, so for me, uh, you know, I, I graduated uh, with a degree in political science from. St. Mary's College of Maryland in Southern Maryland. I played four years of uh, basketball there and I had an I had an extra semester to kind of finish up things. And um, my head coach at the time, as I was finishing up my senior year, leans over to me during one of our last games and says, uh, 
hey, how would you like to coach next year? I know you got to finish up your semester and, you know, what, you know, would you be interested in doing that? I said, hey, look, I, I love basketball. I love athletics. Let me try that. You know, at that point, my track was to to go to law school and to, you know, die, uh, go into uh, international law. And, you know, with, but with that opportunity to coach basketball, it took me into a whole another path. And um, I, I enjoyed every minute of it and couldn't be more and more, uh, have more and more gratitude for the opportunities I've had. So, I coached college basketball for uh, at St. Mary's College for three years and got the opportunity to get my uh, master's degree at Mount St. Mary's. I uh, got my master's in arts of teaching as I uh, was a graduate assistant uh, in our learning services department while I coached uh, Division One basketball, which was a pretty unique experience. Um, and then I got the opportunity as I continued uh, coaching uh, to go to the College of Holy Cross in Worcester, Mass. Uh, coached there for five years. And then what in, inevitably happens in athletics or in any uh, kind of any career field, uh, we got fired. Uh, and so my boss at the time um, was relieved of his duties. And so was myself and our um, a couple of our other assistant coaches were relieved. Uh, you know, we had a new athletic director who came in and just wanted to go a whole nother di uh, direction, even though we were having some success on the court. Um, he just felt that the, a change was needed. So I, I was I had to make a change myself. And what happened was I was looking to stay in, in coaching and some things didn't work out um, the right way or to my to my benefit. And eventually, uh, Mount St. Mary's actually called and said, hey, look, we have a position open, director of athletic development. We know you don't have a whole lot of fundraising experience, but we know that you heavily involved in athletics. You understand athletics. You know Mount St. Mary's. Um, why don't you interview and we'll see if it, there's an opportunity there and went on the interview and got the job. Uh, and from there, I just kind of grew, uh, over eight, eight and a half years in my athletics leadership. Uh, I went from fundraising, uh, being the primary fundraiser for all, all of our athletics programs to marketing, uh, then to, uh, sports supervision, uh, and to a number of other, um, uh, areas of responsibilities within athletics, uh, including being part of strategic plan, uh, being part of the growth plan for, for Mount St. Mary's University. I was involved in a lot of different presidential initiatives uh, that really helped shape and gave me the experiences to prepare me for uh, my current position now as the uh, director of athletics at Catholic University, along with being the associate vice president of student affairs. And, and you know, I, I wanted to share my journey with you because I think that it along the way I, I was able to develop a lot of really strong relationships that helped shape my my leadership perspectives and my leadership uh, philosophies and that were that were really important and I, and I got them from a lot of different areas you know obviously my parents my family were huge influences on my leader uh, in my leadership world they had um, done a lot in their respective career fields and leadership and had helped guide me being a student athlete and having the, the coaches that I had uh, whether it was in basketball I was also played baseball for a sh um, throughout high school and a little bit into college those coaches had great influences on my uh, leadership um, philosophies but I I had a director of learning services who was uh, who, when I was a graduate assistant at Mount St Mary's she had unbelievable influence on me, just the way that she talked with people, the way that she approached um, uh, her, the problems that occur came up in the office, the way that she managed um, crisis with a lot of our students at Mount St. Mary's really had a big impact on me and, and shaped how I approached uh, the different crises that I would face, not only as a coach, but also as an athletic administrator. Um, and then along the way too, uh, just, People that you meet. There was a there was a gentleman at um, at Mount St. Mary's uh, um, who was the director of financial aid, and he was very influential in my life as he was a strong advisor to me. I could go to him, bounce out different ideas off of you know things that I were I was thinking about, and get a a wholly different perspective that was outside of athletics. I was able to bounce off of, and so I, I say that because I think it's very important that. Don't overlook any relationships that you have as you as you continue your journey in your career field. I think they all have can have significant impacts on your leadership abilities and your leadership um, uh, perspectives. And so, really get to know each and every people you come, each and every person you come in contact with, um, and, and dive in. Ask it. Be curious. Ask questions. I think that goes a long way in helping you 
really get to the heart of who you are as a leader and and how you want to develop your leadership philosophies. Um, you know, some other influences that I had are our, our director of athletics at Mount St. Mary's uh, University. Um, uh, she was incredible. She was one at the time that she was brought on as athletic director. It was actually when I was coaching basketball there. She was one of, I believe, eight female athletic directors in the entire country. Uh, at the time of her retirement last year, she was the longest tenured female athletic director in the country. And what she did is she approached everything with such genuine care, the way that she cared about each of the student athletes, their the relationships that they have with their coaches, the relationships they have with their parents. Uh, she really valued that and dove into that. Um, I think that, you know, and that we'll get to something we'll talk about here in a little bit, but the way that she led with love and not fear that she loved that each and every student athlete, each and every coach in the athletic department really had a significant impact on how I approach um, my, my current role now as director of athletics at a Catholic. And it really had a, a, an inspiring influence on me um, in terms of understanding that each and every person in that you're coming in contact that you lead that you're collaborating with they all have different stories and you never know where they're at in their story and so you got to treat them with empathy you got to treat them with genuine care you got to love them you got to put trust in them and i think that is a shift in mindset uh from how athletics was traditionally viewed that you know you 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 lead with a strong hand you lead with fear it's either you know it's it's your way and that's the only way and i think what uh the athletic director at Mount St. Mary's really showed me is that you you can personalize your leadership, that you each each person can get a different type of leadership from you. Sometimes it is you have to be a little bit more uh, firm and strong with how you're handling the situation. And then other situations need a little bit more care and finesse and understanding. And it's and, and as you go through those different experiences, you have to really kind of learn, you know, when you have to apply that that genuine care that sympathetic arm around the shoulder or you have to challenge them you have to you know be a little bit more firm so you know that her influence was was very strong uh for me another one was uh so i had two bosses at mount st mary's i had a director of athletics and i also had our vice president of advancement and they were both two totally different leaders uh our vice president of advancement was very high energy high enthusiasm very much we're going to big ideas. We're going to be, we're going to run down every idea. We're going to figure out the problems and we're going to go get after it. And, and that had a significant in, impact on me. I am a high energy, very enthusiastic person, positive mindset. I really believe that we can figure out the solution to any problem. And that's important in, in, in leadership. I, I, I really firmly believe that you have to be solution oriented, that you have to be able to look at a problem and not get uh, not put blame on on the issue, not complain about it, not get defensive about the issue, that you really attack it with, uh, you know, being solution oriented and really, you know, developing that plan, executing that plan and staying positive no matter what roadblocks going to uh, hit you. So uh, our, our vice president of advancement at Mount St. Mary's really had a big influence on that part of my leadership principles. And that's why I say, like, you, you always have to be looking out for for how people can impact you and influence you. And to be honest with you, I've also, you know, throughout my career as a coach, I was influenced by our student athletes. The the development that I saw from our student, uh, the student athletes that I coached, when you have a 18 year old, um, 18 year old freshman, that's you know, you know, thinks they know everything in the world. They, they, they do. And, you know, I have a 13 year old right now and she thinks she knows everything there is to know in the world. And, you know, and then watch that kind of break down. And then build back up by the time they graduate at 22 year old, 22 years old or 21 years old with a confidence, a knowledge that they that they do, that they can learn and that they can grow, that they don't know everything they thought they did, but they're willing to put themselves out there to keep learning and keep growing. And that is that those student athletes have had a great impact on uh, and influence on my life as well. And then in some other areas where you can uh, find influence is just in the world that we in, live in with information flow is so quick. You know, there's a lot of great podcasts out there, um, not only in the athletic space, but in the in all different phases, whether it's uh, health and medicine or business or education. Um, 
all different areas. You have to be willing to open your mind up and, you know, I'd be happy to share some of those different podcasts with you. I think, uh, you know, actually I'll go ahead and share with you. Um, I just pulled my phone real quick, the podcast that I really listened to. Um, so there's the high performance, uh, podcast is fantastic. Huberman lab, which is a very popular one. Get a lot of great stuff off of that. The school of greatness by Lewis house is awesome. Like he brings in people from all, all different career fields, all walks of life that are, that excel and are experts in those areas. They talk about how they became experts in those areas, how they became strong leaders. I really, really um, suggest that one. He brings a lot of great, uh, great people onto his show. Uh, the learning leader show with Ryan Hawk is another big one. Um, he does a fantastic job of bringing in people from all, all walks of life um into his uh onto his podcast and you know for me i have a 40 minute commute it's perfect for podcasts i'm able to really dive in uh listen to him fully and, and you know that usually gets me going for the day um and then another favorite of mine is john gordon um and i started with john gordon um when he was wrote the energy bus i read probably 80 percent of the books that he's written I'm a big positive mindset guy, um, and he's had a huge influence on the way that I approach things from that mindset. Um, so I highly suggest if you haven't, uh, if you don't know John Gordon, that you get to know him. Uh, you read his book. Some of it can be a little repetitive, but his recent stuff has, uh, has grown and, and matured in, in the way it talks about positivity. And it's not the Pollyanna positivity. It's about being positive, finding solutions not blaming people, not complaining about things, really kind of focus on taking care of what you can take care of, control what you can control. And that's something that we impart a lot on our uh, student athletes here at Catholic is making sure that they um, that they stay positive because it gets really hard in the, in the college athletic space. There's a lot of different influences that can be hitting our student athletes and they got to do their best to, you know, have that positive mindset. It's really easy for them to, when a loss, you know, when, when they lose a game or they don't get, or they're not playing, or they fail a test or don't do as well on a test as they thought they would, that they, they, they can spiral a little bit. And we got to try to keep that positive mindset. So John Gordon's another guy that both from a podcast standpoint and also um, books uh, is a strong influence of mine. Um, social media. I know social media gets a lot of bad raps and that's definitely the case in a, in a lot of ways, but there are some really good people on social media uh, in the athletic space that I, um, that I, that I utilize for quick, like just rem reminders about what leadership is about. Um, you know, they give me some pointers. I pick up some new nuances that I, that I can then establish and work with um, um, uh, on a basis, uh, work with, with our coaches, with our um, student athletes, with my support, support staff. Some really good, um, and I'll pull up my Twitter right now. Some really good Twitter uh, handles to follow are um, uh, Coach AJ Mental Fitness. Very good. So he is um, at Co Co Coach AJ Kings. Really good. Um, Brian Kite. And I'll talk about Brian here in a little bit, but he his uh, Twitter is at T Brian Kite, K I G H T. He is fantastic with. Um, really a strong leadership uh, philosophy of mine, E plus R equals L. I'll talk about that here in a minute, but he's a really good follow as well. Um, Kevin DeShazo, at Kevin DeShazo. Um, he brings some really high level stuff uh, in the athletic space and in the leadership space. Um, and then Greg Burge is really good in the coaching space um, at GB1121. And, you know, I, I say that because you, you can pick up leadership nuggets wherever you go. And I think it's very important that you open, keep your mind open and be able to pull from all different areas, whether it's social media, podcast, books. Um, right now, we have a book club going on at um, uh, with our coaching staff, and we're reading Legacy by James Kerr. For those of you that aren't familiar with Legacy, it is uh, the story of the, uh, of the principles of the All Blacks, uh, the most successful sporting team uh, in the entire world, or the, um, the men's rugby team from New Zealand. And... I will tell you one thing, Legacy by James Kerr, it has to be the top one of the top five books you read for um, for leadership. Uh, the principles that uh, they talk about in, in Legacy um, have meaning no matter what field you're in, no matter what type of uh, leader you are, they, they have enduring principles that you need to, need to know. 
good to great by Jim's Con- Jim Collins is a tried and true one. Um, and rightfully so. I think that's a really good book. Um, growth Mindset by Carol Dweck is another one that dives more into the psychology of uh, the growth mindset uh, or the psychology of mindset. Um, she was a professor at Stanford. She's really good. She has big influence on uh, on Huberman. Um, you know, when we talk about the podcast, the Huberman, Huberman Lab. Um, so Carol Dweck is another good one. Um, and I, I give, I try to get my leadership from wherever I can get it from, whether it's from, you know, watching my, my seven-year-old play to, uh, you know, going and listening to the president of the, the Redskins talk about business leadership. I'm going to, and everything in between, I'm going to, I'm trying to pull little nuggets out that help shape my leadership philosophies, um, as I move forward. Now, transitioning a little bit from my influences, I kind of want to talk with you guys about what I've done in my first four months at Catholic University, because I think that will help you when you're trying to establish your your leadership um, philosophies and trying to establish it yourself in new situations. Um, for me, it was very important that, first and foremost, that I was present each and every day in the office. I, you know, as an athletic director, you have... There's a number of stakeholders that you have to be mindful of and address, whether it's your um, university uh, administrators, whether it's the president, uh, other VPs, other associate VPs, getting to know people in student affairs, getting to know people in admissions, getting to know people in um, the advancement uh, world. Um, you know, you, you got to make sure you're 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 developing relationships with them. Also, you know, for in college athletics, revenue generation is a huge piece of it. And that a lot of that comes from donors and a lot of and gifts to the to the university. So what I have to do is get out and I have to meet donors. And so that sometimes takes me away from the office. And I, I was strategic about the donors that I met in these first four months and where I would go. But a lot of it was I wanted to make sure that I was present with our coaches and then with our student athletes, um, you know, I started June 2nd. So a lot of that June and July was making sure that I got to know our support staff. I got to know our head coaches. And what I found was that they cared a lot about Catholic University. They really, though, wanted to be great. They felt that their that greatness can be attained here and that they just were missing a, a, a few things here and, he, here and there, whether it was you know, struggles in communication or not talking about being great enough or lack of energy, you know, and just kind of listen to what they had to say about what was missing. And as I did my assessments of, you know, what we needed to take care of at, at Catholic. And then once August 8th came around, training camp started for football. Now it's about getting to know the student athletes, making sure we're there, being present, listening to what their needs are. They're, they are the people that make it run without student athletes, there is no athletic department. So making sure that we, that they understood that, that they were the main thing and that we keep the main thing, the main thing. And is that that's their student athlete experience. So talking with every program, making sure we're present at every one of their games, that is a big thing that, that human touch feel presence really goes a long way when trying to establish your leadership principles. And so as I talked, listen, assessed, um, and then I took my philosophies and added that to it. We had conversations around what are the roles and responsibilities for our support staff? What are the roles and responsibilities for our coaches? What are the standards and expectations that we have, that we want to have for Catholic University? What is the vision that we want to have? And so I worked on each of the, and I'm still working on those things, but I want to share with you some of, you know, where we're landing right now. So in terms of vision for Catholic University and this I think, and that's very important for whatever um, whatever you're leading, whatever organization you're leading, it's important that you create a vision. So for us, we want to be one of the elite athletic departments in in the in the country for Division three. And you know right now we are you know we're at that very good, maybe above average level. We want to move into the elite space. Johns Hopkins is a perfect example of an elite athletic department. What they do, not only on their on the field results, but how they form their coaches, the leadership that uh, Jen Baker brings to um, to the athletic department is something that I look up to because I you know watching what she's done and how she's kept moving the bar up uh, higher and higher has been impressive. Uh, schools like University of Chicago, Williams, Amherst, those are schools that we're looking at and saying we can be that. 
but we got to make sure that we do certain, we have to be really intentional and purposeful and how we move up the ladder within college athletics. And so in order to do that, we had to create that vision. And so the vision was to be the elite, one of the elite athletic departments in, in all of division three, and also be the number one faith-based um, uh, athletic department in division three. We feel like, we, you know, that is a unique niche for us. We've identified that. And we know our being a faith-based institution is very strong uh, in terms of our mission and also who we are. So we want to lean into that as well. Now, to, in order to get to be elite, I had to work with our support staff on developing our standards and expectations. And, you know, and for me, I, I brought some things to the table, but I also let them kind of identify where, um, what, how we needed to establish those standards and expectations. So it took a lot of collaboration. We talked with the coaches. We talked with, uh, like I said, the support staff. I gathered input from different university um, uh, administrators who have been here for a long time. And the the ten five standards, five expectations we landed on are this. Number one uh, standard is elite communication. What I was hearing from across the board is that there was not strong communication from administrators to coaches, coaches to student athletes, and just all the stakeholders didn't feel like they were being communicated to properly. So when we talk about elite communication, we are talking about timely, honest, consistent communication. It is right behind me. All right, I had to make sure our standards and expectations are up in our up in our office so that everyone that walks in knows what they are, they are understanding that, and we can have uh, discussions about it. So elite communication is a big one for us. And, and within elite communication is the fact that you have to be able to give and accept feedback. That is a very, very important thing. Not only can you give feedback, but are you accepting the feedback? And I tell our coaches, I tell our support staff, like, you guys got to check me. If I'm not as I'm not, and because I'm not perfect, and we're in, in nor should I be. But if I'm not living to the standards and expectations that we've set forth as the athletic department, you have every right to check me on that. Talk to me about it. Say, hey, Kevin, you're not living up to our standards, to our expectations, and and, and tell me why, and show me why. And I have to be willing to accept that feedback. I think as a leader, you have to be able to open yourself up to that type of constructive criticism in order for you to get better, in order for the whole organization to get better. So lead communication is a big one for us. Um, it fuels accountability and it re gives respect to the individuals that are communicating to one another. Our second expect, our second standard is be great. Focus on being great every day. Be the best that you can be each and every day. And that for each person, that's gonna be different, but we want each, each individual in an organization to be focusing on trying to strive for greatness each and every day. And that, that's important to us. The third one is empower others to find their greatness. And this is a very big one for me. I think as we look towards what is at the crux of the student athlete experience is can our coaches, can our student athletes help others become great? And that is the crux of servant leadership. We have to be servant leaders. And so empowering others to find their greatness is a big one for us. We want to make sure that that we are promoting that, that we're talking about that, and also that we are speaking to it in terms of you have to be able to be striving for your individual greatness each day while also helping others find their own greatness. Feel empowered to help others. That's where that and that's strong leadership, that's servant leadership. The fourth one, this is a big one for me, and this is one that Chris kind of touched on is that we lead with love. I think we're over the last 15, 20 years, uh, the mindset in athletics has shifted. It used to be the, the lead with fear, the, um, the Bob Knight's uh, leadership. You know, it's my way or the highway. If you don't do it the right way, which is my way, you're gone, you're out. And we're just going to beat that into you day in and day out, day in and day out, repetition, do it my way, do it my way. That has shifted in athletics. And I think it has shifted in leadership overall. We have to be more cognizant and we have to, we shouldn't work towards the love piece as the end piece. The love, lead with love should be first and foremost, that we welcome everybody into our organization, that we love them from the get-go. And through loving them and genuine care, then we can create trust. And that's when, when that trust is created, now you can really have those tougher conversations. You create significant connections. And we have noticed that when the, there are strong connections between the coach and student athlete or administrator and, and um, coach, that you can have much tougher conversations. You can have those hard conversations that are 
that are uncomfortable, that are that get to the heart of the problem, the heart of the issue, and the both people involved in the conversation don't take it personally because they know that there's a mutual love, a mutual trust, and there, there's that connection there. And that's where you get that inspiration. That's where you can inspire others to find that greatness. And then you can empower others to help others find that greatness. So we really look at it as a linear thing of love, trust, um, connection, inspiration, empowerment. But that, that leading with love is a, is a crucial shift in, menta- in mindset for leadership uh, in athletics and in some other areas. And so we we want to make sure that we are uh, promoting that within our athletic department, that when our coaches recruit student athletes into our athletic department, that they are leading them with love first and foremost, and they are creating that trust. When we hire someone into our athletic department, that we are leading with love, that we are helping them guide them through. We're not just dropping them in and saying, hey, this is how you do it and figure it out. Like, you know, this is just the way that we do it. No hey, here is how we do it. And these are the different steps we're going to take. You know, we're going to be collaborative. We're going to work on this. We're going to work on that. And we lead with love. We lead with trust. And we create those strong, strong connections because that's really where the magic happens. Our fifth um, standard is humility. No one person is above the organization. I think sometimes in leadership, leaders feel like they put themselves up here and everybody else is down here and that they are more important to the organization that if they go, the organization will fall apart. If that's the case, then you have you don't have a strong organization. The, the the strength of the organization comes from the ability for everyone to work together, to collaborate, to know that we're all in in this together, that we're all that we have great respect and admiration and gratitude for all the work and efforts that everyone puts in day to day to make the organization great and to keep making the organiz- organization great. Um, you know, and that, and that leads me to another point is that, you know, it's not one of our standards or expectations, but never settle. Um, you know, when we talk about being great, it's about trying to be great each and every day and that you don't settle for any result that you get, that it's all about moving to that next level. When you, when you, you win a championship, okay, enjoy it, but Hey, how do we, how do we win that next championship? How do we sustain that excellence day in and day out? And that goes back to humility that everyone is though, is working towards making the organization better each and every day. And that it's not about any one person. It is about the group effort that, that goes into it. Those are our five standards. We want to move into our five expectations. Um, our number one expectation is be solution oriented. I've talked about this a little bit, and where this really uh, goes into one of my big influences I talked about on Brian Kite is this notion of E plus R equals O, event plus response equals outcome. And this is something I've I've been learning about over the last four or five years. I, I it came to my came to me in a podcast when I was riding my bike during COVID, you know, those long, you know, two hour bike rides where I'm just had the headphones and they kept talking about this in this one podcast, kept talking about E plus R equals O. And it it really stuck with me. And and something that we talk about with our student athletes all the time and our coaches all the time, you can't control the events that happen to you and you can't really control the outcomes. What will dictate the outcomes is your response. So we really focus in on that R and being disciplined in our responses to each and every event. If you're blaming, complaining, getting defensive about things, that's a negative response. And so if you have a negative re- event, a negative response, you have nothing but a negative outcome. But if you have a negative event and a positive response, then you have a you have a much more likely um a, you're much more likely to have a positive outcome. And so we really kind of talk about what is that response when when you lose a game, how do you respond in practice the next day? If you aren't getting the shots that you, you know, the number of shots that you want in the game, what is that response? Are you going to blame the coach? Are you going to blame your teammates? Are you going to complain that you're, you know, that your hands were wet, that your, you know, your legs were tired? You get defensive. Hey, that's not on me. I I was, I wasn't open. That's why I didn't make the shot or I got fouled. Like we, we try to take all those type of things out and it's about owning your response, controlling, controlling your response, you know, and just like in life, Hey, you may, you know, we talk about our student athletes. You may get a C on a test where you thought you got an A. What's your response to that? Are you going to blame the professor? Are you going to work hard to, you know, make sure that next time you improve that grade? You know, it, it's all about that R so, and and having a plan within that response that is positive and in, in, um, and has, show some grit uh, to it because that's that's what we're looking for. Uh, so being solution-oriented, 
having resilience, understanding that there's going to be issues that come up all the time and how do we respond to that? Our second expectation is, um, oh man, it just went right out of my head. Oh, have a growth mindset. Have a growth mindset. We've talked about it a little bit, but being positive, making sure that we are um, really uh, trying to listen to grow. What you know today should not be what you know tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, that we are willing to listen to different perspectives, grow in your leadership, grow in who you are. That is something that's very important for us. Um, our third our third one speaks a little bit more to athletics, but can be applied to anything. Have competitive excellence. Make sure that we are working towards uh, towards winning, towards being great, that we that we are, when we go out to practice, we are trying to win that practice, that we are taking pride and passion in that practice and trying to win that game in who we are, that in understanding that we have a tradition of competitive excellence and that the um, our, our student athletes that came before us, the people that came before us laid an unbelievable foundation for that organization that we got to take pride and passion in, that we live up to those expectations and that we perform at the highest level we possibly can. Our fourth expectation is relationship building, all right? Show up for one another, have each other's backs, understand that, that in the organization, these are families and each of the individual athletic programs, that these are brotherhoods, sisterhoods, that we are working hard for one another, that we work together through adversity, that we hold each other accountable, that we be inclusive of all different perspectives, having that diversity of perspective. That is something that's very big for us in terms of making sure we develop those strong relationships and talking to our student athletes about, you never know who that person's gonna, that you're gonna meet that's gonna change the trajectory of your life. It could be that coach, it could be that teammate, it could be that athletic administrator, whatever the case may be, that changes the course of your life. Um, so really making sure that you're being intentional and purposeful about building relationships with people for, uh, with all different perspectives, all different backgrounds, and making sure that we really are making those those strong connections. And the last one, this one is, is athletics, but it also should pertain to any organizations that you're in. Have fun. Ha enjoy, enjoy the time that you're in there. Making sure you're promoting that the the laughter the the high energy high enthusiasm have a passionate joy for your organization like and understand and it's hard it's hard like and this probably is a little bit more athletics focused but it's not a job that it, re it requires hard work and focus but it should be fun but that's where your passion has to show for you know how much you love your organization we talk a lot about uh with this piece about something I got from Shaka Smart, who's the head coach at uh, Marquette University men's basketball. He talks a lot about EGBs. EGBs are energy giving behaviors. And for us, that's high fives, that's fist pumps, that's smiling at one another in the hallway. That is making sure that we bring good energy each and every day, that you know we cheer for our teammates, that we're happy when our teammates achieve you know great things, that, it's not, that we're not so, um, focused on self that we're focused on the on the the greater the greater organization so uh we, we really and it's kind of latched on here like there's a lot of high fives a lot of fist pounds uh going on in the office amongst our student athletes and then those type of things create energy and enthusiasm um you know one thing about shaka smart they did it they they track their egbs for games and in a, in a two-hour game against seton hall last year around christmas time where it's usually tough to get energy from the student athletes uh, they tracked it. They had 3,068 uh, EGBs during the course of a game. That that was twice as much as they had ever had. But they had put a focus on it, and it really helped them get through a tough a tough uh, period. And they ended up, you know, winning the game by like 14. So that's I, I do focus on EGBs around here. I don't know how you can use that in your organizations, but um, you know, it's something that we really kind of uh, bring forth uh, here. And then one last thing I want to talk about, and then I'll get to the questions. Is you know you have to be mindful in your organizations as a leader of burnout, of, of making sure that, and this goes to leading with love, is that you have to know where your, where your um, coworkers are, where the people that you lead, where are they at in their life? Are they getting burned out? Is the, is the stress of the job getting to be too much? We are noticing that a lot with our student athletes that they put a lot of stress because they're high achievers on being as successful as they possibly can um, on the field and on the court, in the pool, whatever the case may be. And they are burning themselves out too much. And we are trying to be more mindful of that we're putting a lot more resources into 
um, our mental health um, here at Catholic University, and it's it's and, and into their wellness, making sure that they uh, their nutrition is right, that they're that, that we have the uh, proper sports medicine um, uh, capabilities that we're focusing on strength and conditioning. But the mental health piece is a, is a strong piece for us, and I think that that pertains to any organization that you're mindful of the people that you work with and you know that work for you that you're not stressing them out to the point where they're not going to be able to be productive. You have to be paying attention to them. And that comes through the relationship building that comes through leading with love through those connections that you can recognize when they're struggling and that you may have to back off a little bit and give them some space, maybe tell them, Hey, you know, you might need a day. You might need, we might need to lessen your load for a little bit as you work through, uh, you know, some of this burnout because we want all of our, we want our high performing and high achieving, um, uh, uh, members of our organization to be at optimal efficiency, but we have to also recognize when they they've gone past that point and you're not getting um, not getting as much from them as you possibly can because you you push them too far. So um, really paying attention to mental health is something that we put an emphasis on uh, within our um, organization here. And I think it's something that pertains to any organization uh, that that you're leading. So. That's a, little, a lot for me. I know I threw a lot at you guys, um, but I'm happy to take any questions uh, that you guys have. Let's see here. Uh, I'm sorry. Touchpad. Okay. First of all, Kevin, thank you so much. My, my gosh, that was incredible. You, you really gave us an awful lot to think about, and thank you for the organization of it. I'm glad this is recorded because people will have a chance to go back and absorb some of this, uh, some of the uh, leads that you gave regarding podcasts and and uh, social media. Um, we do have a question already in the Q&A, so I'll call that up. Alexandra asks, do you utilize team building activities with your staff team? More specifically, team building activities that focus on learning or understanding the set standards and expectations. Yeah, that's a great question, Alexander, and uh, I appreciate the uh, appreciate the question. I think I, I'm a little informal in my team building exercises, um, in that I will just you know I'll take our group out to lunch, or we'll we'll pull together you know I'll just I'll walk down the hallway and I'll be like, hey guys, let's get together. I've really been thinking about elite communication and, and something that, you know, this is what, it, how, how can we better communicate with our coaches? What are some of those different ways that we can communicate? So I do a lot of informal team building, um, formal team building. We, um, we had the book club with our coaches, who I think is a really good team building uh, uh, sense and it's building right now. We only have four or five that are participating, but we have others that are, that are um, diving in on it. Um, so I think that that one, uh, that that book club is really good um in terms of, of team building uh we part we are at a lot of events together um our coaches support one another uh, strongly so they go to different events and what we do is we find ourselves really um talking with one another about hey this coach did that or this coach did that how can i apply it um to um how can i apply it to you know, my program and those type of things. Um, we have monthly head coaches meetings uh, where it's our support staff and our head coaches come together. We have different topics and here in a bit, I got one more. And then in November, I'm going to have start having our individual coaches uh, lead a 20 minute segment in uh, the head coaches meeting. So that they have more ownership over, uh, over those head coaches meetings. It's not just me sitting up there talking uh, to them. I want them more actively engaged uh, with uh, with the program, so that's that's something where we will focus in on. But in uh, in terms of formal team building, we do a retreat um, at the beginning of the year where we kind of hone in on uh, what those standards and expectations for the year are going to be. Um, I have my I just had my first one, so we'll see how the second one goes. How I make those adjustments, you know, already in my head, I'm like, you know, I don't want our standards and expectations to be just set in place i want if, if we need to tweak them or if we need to move one out for a new one that that the that group feels is necessary i'm i'm willing to think about think that through and see if that's a possibility as well okay thank you uh we have a couple of questions in chat and then we'll come back to q a um this question do you have advice on how to handle the communication aspect with teams who are working remotely ah, good question so i think there's a lot of different um different uh, methods of communicating on your phone. So what we do is we have a, uh, we have group, uh, group me is uh, with our head coaches and support staff. 
And so as people get leadership, um, uh, as people get leadership, um, or read leadership articles or read a good book or come across a podcast or just have a question for the group about how they, they, they can put that in the, in that group meet chat. And we're going back and forth on that stuff. Sometimes we'll have like a lot of firing back at nine 30 at night, you know, just going back and forth, um, which, which is good. I think making sure that you're intentional about, you know, for, for remote, um, for leading remote people, being intentional about your check-ins with each and every one of the members of your organization or the people that you lead, like that, that's very important. Show that shows that you care. I, I think that that that's a strong way to do it. I don't think there's anything formal. I think whatever best suits you uh, and how you communicate, but I think there needs to be some way of communication. Like if you, if you're, if you make phone calls, if you're a texture, if you use the group me or WhatsApp uh, apps on your phones, um, you know, whatever works best for you and works best for you and works best for your group. I, I would say lean in on that. Um, if it's a zoom call once a week to make sure everybody's uh, touching base, that's great. We have with my senior staff. So there's five uh, members, five members of my senior staff. We meet twice a week um in person but if it's if it's if you don't have that capability i would su suggest you know just having a 30 minute you know on mondays and thursdays just to make sure hey what happened uh you know for us it's what happened this past weekend you know with all the games what what fires did we put out and then on thursday it's like okay what do we need to prepare for what's happening who do i need to make sure i'm meeting you know what what coaches are struggling a little bit who do i need to talk to those type of things uh that we really kind of hone in on, on on those meetings Great. Another question from chat before we go to Q&A. What book are you currently reading as a team? Uh, we are, we are, uh, and I've already read it, so um, I let them choose it. We're reading uh, Legacy by James Kerr. And I mean, I've read it three times and it, I gain more and more from it each and every time I read it. Like it's really, um, really uh, strong leadership stuff and it, it just applies to it. any type of leadership. We just, uh, you know, today, today we actually had book club and we uh, we read chapters five and six. Like, I don't want to, chapter five was about learning and about that growth mindset. Uh, chapter six, I can't call it, I can't say the name of the topic because it's a little <laughs> bit of a curse word, uh, but uh, uh, it's basically having uh, no bad people in your organization and how to identify that. And I thought that that's a really strong one and how to, um, you know, your culture dictates what that what that is about. Thank you. And then, uh, incidentally, Peter put in the chat the full title for people who want to look that up. Okay, here's another Q&A question. Um, what was the turning point for you as either an athlete or a leader that made you see the importance of leading with love? Oh, that's a that's a good one. I think I think as when I was a coach, um, you know, I've always been a very positive, high energy, high enthusiasm, high, highly enthusiastic, passionate person saw the way I played. I was never the most athletic or never the most um, talented uh, player on the court. I, I was the one that do dove for loose balls. I took charges. I did all the dirty work. Um, and I just, but I just loved the game. Um, but I don't think I fully realized that how important, because I, I was also could take constructive criticism. You could yell at me, you could get on me, you could tear me up, tear me down. And I'd be, I'd be able to respond. Um, but not everybody can handle that. Not and, and you know I'll talk to my brother was was more talented of an athlete than I was was a better basketball player than I was but our you know our high school coach he was that he led with fear he led with you know I'm gonna tear you up tear you down and my brother cannot he did not respond well to that I responded well to that and I think that that helped me understand that hey we, you got to lead with love you got to figure out where people are you got to um, understand where. Um, that people need to be talked to a little bit differently depending on who you are. So you have to get to know them. You have to connect with them. But I think I fully realized it over the last two or three years, uh, to really, to be honest with you. I think um, the track and field coach at, at Mount St. Mary's University, this gentleman, Jay Phillips, is just a phenomenal human being. Uh, he's a really good coach, but just more so as a phenomenal human being. And him and I would have these conversations regarding ethical leadership and just how important ethical leadership was, was in athletics and how it was an underutilized aspect of leadership in athletics. And we we came, we came talked a lot about humility, integrity, courage, justice, and how we you can lean in on those type of things or those elements of um, you know, the Catholic religion, but also ethical leadership to help 
uh, strengthen your culture and uh, as a as a whole athletic department. And that really led me into thinking about leading with love. And um, him and I have bounced that around for the last couple of years, and I'm still forming it, but um, it, it's really a strong um, a strong part of my leadership philosophy that we that we love everybody that comes into our organization, that we give trust to everybody that comes into our organization um, without without any type of preconceived notion. And I think that that helps, um, you know, they can lead to some, you know, 18 to 22 year olds are very manipulative sometimes and they can they can take advantage of it. But I'd rather have it that way than the other way. Thank you for that. Um, and I will ask the last question unless another question comes up because we still have a little bit of time. One of the things you said both the first time we talked in the summer and then as we were preparing for tonight, and you might have even mentioned it along the way, is how important it is to consider all of the stakeholders. And I, I thought that was a neat point. Could you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think you have to be in, in athletics and in, in or, any organization, there are numerous external and internal stakeholders. You know, for athletics, you have university official, you, you know, I have my I have my bosses, you know, the president of the university, my vice, the vice president of student affairs, um, other university um, administrators, you have your student athletes, you have your coaches, you have your support staff uh, that you have to be mindful of. And that you have to make sure that they're giving input into the, the, the development of the culture of the organization, the direction, the vision of the organization. Um, but I think also that um, you also have your external stakeholders, whether they be parents, alumni, donors, uh, corporate sponsors, uh, you know, uh, the fans that come to the games, uh, community leaders, you have to be, so you're managing all these different stakeholders and each, each of the different stakeholders, you got to approach a little bit differently. You have your base way of approaching them for me, leading with love, passion, enthusiasm, but you know, the, the conversations I'm having with a student athlete are going to be different than the conversations I'm having with a corporate sponsor. And you got to be able to be able to recognize those different situations. You know, some, you know, a lot of times, you know, with parents, they get involved with, uh, you know, they, they, they are very protective of their children. And so, you know, we have to have, um, you know, some very tough conversations with parents sometimes around uh, a variety of different issues. And so, you know, the, the conversations I'm having with my parents are going to be different than the conversations I'm having with, um, you know, the, the director of admissions or the dean of admissions. So, you know, being, making sure that you're, um, you know, be, being very aware of who your stakeholders are and that you have to, you know, you may have to share your vision. You have to make sure you're sharing your vision and making sure you're staying true to the, the, the standards and expectations of the organization, which means you have to do it in some different ways. Okay, this is wonderful. Let me double check, make sure I'm not cheating anybody. Um, all right. And all right. Anybody we have, uh, I have six minutes by my clock. Anybody else want to ask anything? Otherwise, we'll. Okay. Um, Kevin, I want to thank you one more time. This this was just terrific. Uh, oh, hey, Chris, I, I really uh, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to come come um, uh, to meet with you guys to talk with you guys. Um, you know, I have great passion around leadership, especially uh, in the athletic space. I think there's um, there's just so much. It's so interesting uh, to work in athletics and to be developing, you know, young people. Uh, I, I'll end with one, one quick thing is, uh, Rick Pitino, very, very, probably one of the best basketball coaches of all time. He, when he talks to, uh, organizations, he, he has everyone say, Hey, how many of you guys have an 18 to 22 year old? And, you know, the, uh, room full of, uh, you know, middle-aged people, about three quarters of the room raises their hands say, I do. And then he goes, all right, how many of you want your livelihood based on those 18 to 22 year olds? And then everybody's <laughs> hand goes down and, and that's what we're dealing with. And it's, it's, we're, it, but it's a fantastic uh, time to really create great impact. You, say, you have these uh, individuals coming in at 18 years old that, you know, think they know everything and they know nothing and they're developing and they're doing that. And they leave out at 22 years old, ready to be successful in their in their lives and you know that four-year development or in some cases five-year development that we get with them is just it's it's a vital piece in their in their growth and development we have and we get to make a great impact on that and that's something that i really really enjoy about the athletic space and it's it's um 
something I take great pride in. And I also understand that's a great responsibility. And so really trying to make sure that we, uh, that we live to that and that our coaches live to that. And then our, you know, and the rest of our uh, support staff uh, lives to that. Thank you so much. Again, um, it was remarkable how much you were able to give us in so short a time and how well organized it was. And thank you for letting us record this because this is going to be an important addition to our archives. Um, and so I'm wishing you all the, all the luck in the future. Since you and my wife are first cousins, our paths will cross again, I'm sure. Uh, either at the next wedding or the next, well, let's hope it's another wedding. Uh, and, <laughs> okay. Uh, so thank you one more time. And thank you everybody who joined us. And we will now sign off. All right. Thank okay. you, Chris. Appreciate everybody's time. Thank you. Already. Bye-bye.